Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you an audio version of an interview I did with Joelle Simone Anthony, and we have a great conversation about disenfranchised grief. So take a listen. Before you go, be sure to subscribe so that you can receive notifications the next time I post an interview. Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and thanks for joining me here for episode number 269. Today, I'll be sharing with you an interview about disenfranchised grief and sacred rituals for healing with Joelle Simone Anthony. And Joelle and I had such a wonderful conversation. I'm really excited to share this interview with you. So hang tight. We'll get to that in just a moment. I really only have one little announcement for you, which is I've been mentioning the last few weeks that I've been busy recording the audiobook for my newest book that's coming out soon. And I am now finished with the recording and editing of the audiobook. Really happy to have that done. I'm ready to submit it and hoping that it meets all of the requirements for sound, since I'm not by any means a sound technician, but hopefully it will be accepted and then ready to go on sale. And so I'm also getting the print book and the ebook already and my target date for release is November 1st of this year. So this new book is titled The Journey from Ego to Soul, How to Transform Your Life When Everything Falls Apart. And so basically I'm looking at the spiritual journey and how we wake up from our ego-driven lives to become soul-guided spiritual people on these paths we have through life and how really falling apart and the difficulties of life is the catalyst for this type of spiritual growth. So that's what this book is about. And uh, November 1st, it'll be available and I'll be leaving links for it when it goes on sale. But I just wanted to let you know there will be a link for the cover so you can take a look at the cover and check that out and get ready for November 1st when it's available to purchase. So without further ado, we'll get on to my interview with Joelle. As I said, I'm so excited to share it with you. Stay tuned afterwards, and I'll come back with just a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Joelle Simone Anthony. Joelle is a licensed funeral director and sacred grief practitioner in Atlanta, Georgia. Spirituality has always been a huge part of her life and professional approach, which is deeply rooted in ancient wisdom passed down from community elders generation to generation. She guides countless families toward healing through the exploration of alternative practices designed to help them navigate and heal their journeys with grief. And you can learn more about Joelle's work at her website, which is thegravewoman.com. And you should follow her on social media too, at um, The Grave Woman. So Joelle, thank you so much for joining me today. Karen, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you and I can't wait for us to dig in. Yes, I'm really excited too. I just, I know this is going to be a really rich conversation, but I was hoping that you'd start by just telling us your story and how you got started doing this work that you're doing. How much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, first off, I like to start my story by paying um, homage to my family, many of whom, um, are now ancestors, um, meaning that they've transitioned. Two of the most influential people in my life have been my my uncle Mark, who was a funeral director and introduced me to my love and passion for funeral service. And my grandfather, who was an entrepreneur and uh, captain in the army and a college professor and just so many other amazing things. But um, my story begins when I was a little girl. I've always been what we refer to in the industry as morbidly curious, meaning that I've been basically obsessed with death, dying, dead bodies, and grief for my entire life. I remember being a five-year-old girl at my great-grandmother's funeral service and wondering if she was sleeping forever, as I understood death to be, why were we watching her sleep? 
who put her clothes and her makeup on, who did her hair, who put her in the bed box and why she had to sleep in the ground forever. Um, and I remember when being a little child, um, maybe eight or nine years old, my uncle going off to mortuary school and him coming back and me making the connection that, oh my gosh, she works with dead people and having millions of questions for him that no one else would answer. Um, and him just taking his time and answering my questions and eventually allowing my sister and I to go to the funeral home with him and help him dress the deceased and instilling in me, you know, that this was a, a part of a job and that the deceased deserved respect just like anyone else that I would see in my life. And that curiosity just grew and grew and grew um, until finally I got a job working in a cemetery is what they call a family service advisor, um, working with individuals who had experienced loss and helping them make burial arrangements for their loved ones. And from there, going on to mortuary school and becoming a licensed funeral director and embalmer and doing what I do now. Wow. So it really sounds like this, this is your path. It's been your path since you were a young child. It really has. And to be honest, I tried to run away from it for a while, um, my teenage and early adult years. But I honestly believe that God or spirit or the universe or however you connect with your higher power or higher power. Like you said, they were like, nope, this is your path and nothing in life is going to go right. and You're not going to feel good about yourself until you answer this call and work along this path. So, yeah. Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you answered that call and that you're doing the work that you're doing. And especially because, as mentioned in your bio, you incorporate spirituality into the work that you do and honor grief and death and dying as sacred. And I think that's really important and something that we really need right now. For sure. And that comes specifically from uh, my hometown. I'm from Beaufort, South Carolina, which is the home of the Gullah and Geechee culture. And for those who aren't familiar with what Gullah and Geechee culture represents, um, Beaufort, South Carolina was one of the original slave ports here in the United States. And so when the slaves were taken from Africa and brought here to America, most of the time they got off of the boat in what is called the Port Royal Sound. And that is in Beaufort, South Carolina. And um, a lot of our heritage and cultural uh, roots are still very much so alive in Beaufort, South Carolina because of our connection to our ancestral roots. So um, a lot of the way that we do death and dying back home is very similar to what is practiced in Africa. Um, it's not necessarily a religious thing, but definitely a spiritual and just sacred thing. So, yeah. That makes sense to me that when we can connect to our ancestral and cultural roots, those traditions can really help us when, when we're going through grief because sometimes we can just feel unmoored in a way when we're grieving like we don't have a foundation we don't have a place to stand or land but <clears throat> those traditions from the past can be so powerful in terms of just stabilizing us and helping us for sure and you know what's so interesting Karen um, I incorporate a lot of you know what I know to be traditional and cultural from back home into the work that I do as a funeral director when I work with families and regardless of race or religion or status, it's like everyone finds comfort in what I offer. Um, of course, I'm very respectful of other people's culture and norms and formalities, but I've, I've had people say to me before, there's just something that I've, I've enjoyed about working with you and I'm not sure what it is, but it, it, I honestly give that credit to the way that I was brought up and the way that we have learned to work with death and dying and those that are grieving back home. Just, And it's not anything, um, I don't want to say major because I, the whole experience is major, but it's just that that culture, it, it speaks, it's universal. So, yeah. 
Yeah, that makes sense to me because death, death and grief are universal and they're really primal. Like from the beginning, right. of, from the beginning of humankind, we've dealt with death and grief. And so it makes sense that we, we draw on all of that long, long earned wisdom and knowledge from the past in order to help us today. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, I know that you have a course on disenfranchised grief, and that's something I really wanted to bring up and discuss, especially right now here in 2020 and what what we're going through right now. So would you start by just for our listeners defining what is disenfranchised grief? Okay. Um, I'm not going to give a textbook definition, but I want to give it in the way that I understand it, if if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so based on what I understand, disenfranchised grief is a type of grief that is not socially as socially accepted and acknowledged um, as, let's say, someone who loses a baby to cis, right? Um, when someone commits suicide, there's a level of shame or grief or, oh, I don't want to touch that with a 10-inch pole, Um as opposed to the person being embraced and having their grief and their loss recognized by society as a whole. When someone is experiencing disenfranchised grief, either from an abortion or maybe their loved one was involved in a drunk driving incident or a suicide or something that society kind of frowns upon and sees as bad or unacceptable, there's a lot of isolation that the griever experiences. And because of that isolation, they're robbed of what we consider to be a good death or good grief experience. Mm-hmm. And I, I really relate to that on the one hand, as I um, I told you before we started the recording that my father died by suicide. And, and looking back at my own grief process, I, I, believe it was disenfranchised though I I didn't know of that (laughs) term or concept back then but I just remember feeling so isolated and really abandoned by a lot of my friends who later told me they just they didn't know what to say or what to do they felt uncomfortable so they just stayed away and I think that was a a complication in a way of that grieving process to not have the support that might have been there if my dad had died of a heart attack. Right. And it's so, um, it's so interesting because my question is always, well, who are we to define what death should look like or what form it should take Um, in preparation for a course that myself and Anita Polar Grant are conducting um, next month You know, I've been speaking to people who we believe have experienced disenfranchised grief. And um, I did an interview this past Saturday with a young lady whose best friend and who was a a high school classmate of mine was out at her birthday party drinking and got into a car accident, killed herself and two other people um, on her birthday. And what the woman I was interviewing shared was that, you know, everybody had an opinion about what happened. And when she would say that she was sad or, you know, she was just having a bad day, people kind of looked at her like, well, how do you think the families of the individuals who were murdered by your friend feel? I'm pretty sure they're having a bad day. That was how she felt, whether those feelings were real or not, or whether that experience was happening the way she thought it was or not that's how she felt in her grief and she expressed that she wished that she just had a safe place to express herself um, when she was grieving and I think it's important as not only professionals but just as everyday people and individuals that we're sensitive to the fact that regardless of how someone's passed away whether we deem it to be acceptable or unacceptable or whatever the circumstances are that we remember that they're experiencing a loss. Mm, yes, and and I would say also well, something I'm sensitive to as a doctor is that I feel like sometimes healthcare professionals may experience a form of disenfranchised grief partly because they're present and witness patient deaths 
but they they aren't really then later included in the grieving process mm. or any of the rituals. And sometimes the healthcare providers end up sometimes there's anger towards them or sometimes they're being blamed for the death, whether that was, you know, whether it was directly their fault or not, but being blamed for not being able to save the patient and the providers probably feel guilt also over the death, but then have no place to go with that grief and those feelings, no, no place to go through a ritual together or, or be recognized for that. So I don't know if that fits as well in that category of disenfranchised grief, but that's something I think about a lot. I think you are 100% correct. And I know what you're saying to be true. Um, prior to, you know, getting my license and even still, I work for Emory University and my last position was with the Winship Cancer Institute, and we I worked very closely with the fellows who were doing their fellowship, the residents, and the faculty. And I know for sure that um, medical providers, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, and even sometimes the um, the janitors uh, and the food care staff, you, you develop relationships with patients, especially if they're there for a long time or been admitted into the hospital. And whether they're, you know, in your direct care or not, you're responsible on some level for their lives. And then we as humans develop personal connections. And then when someone passes away, it's just like on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. And if you happen to develop, develop a very personal and strong connection with a patient and they're gone, who's to say the family's going to even reach out to you to say, hey, the funeral's going to be this day or that day. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, and I've, I've, I've not experienced it, but I've definitely witnessed it, and I've questioned what resources are made available to medical professionals to deal with that. Yeah, in my experience, very few, and that, so I have a concern about that, that it's something we tend to just brush aside and probably repress and decide not to deal with it because there aren't good mechanisms for dealing with it. But then I worry about the consequences of ignoring grief. It seems to me like it's that's actually one of the most important things I think we can do for our mental health is to acknowledge our grief and um, and experience it rather than ignoring it. But But I see it all over our society that that's really what our society seems to prefer is is ignoring grief and and do you see that in your work as well oh for sure um as funeral professionals it's almost thought that or I feel as if it's it's the the assumption is well you signed up to do this type of work so you should be able to handle it or if you can't handle it then why do you have this job or this is your job so get over it um, even though the persons or individuals that come into our care are deceased, we still are grieving things in our own lives. We still have to, you know, a lot of us have individuals in our family that pass away or, you know, just certain cases get to you and you question life and death and you grieve for those who are grieving that you're working with and you internalize that and, um, Personally, I'm an empath, so I'm not only internalizing it on a mental level, but sometimes on an emotional level. So, yeah, it's it's real. It's very real. I know one thing that um, that I, I've been aware of here in 2020, where we're dealing with COVID-19. Even though I personally have not had a, a loved one die from COVID-19, it's it's being here and, and witnessing every day the numbers of people that are dying and hearing stories and just being aware of it happening that I, I do feel like there's this kind of an overwhelming unnamed grief in a way that that's affecting everyone in our society right now do you do you see that or could you talk a little bit about what's what is happening to us right now with this this huge massive death toll from the virus that's going on I wish I could answer that question and I spent a lot of time thinking about this when I was reviewing the question um, and the only thing that I can come up with is that I think we're all grieving our loss of reality the world has literally 
changed. We woke up one day and our world, whether we wanted to, to or whether we agreed with it or whether we said it was okay or not, we were stripped of our reality. And that reality may never return. Life prior to COVID-19 may never return. Um, I think it's going to take years for us to understand what we've witnessed and what we've been through. Um, I don't think anyone right now can look at what's happened in the past six to eight months and say, oh, this is how this is going to affect us moving forward, because this is something that we've never dealt with before in our time. And I think that the effects and ramifications are going to be not only psychological, not only mental and emotional, but also physical. I think our physical bodies are going to react to grief and death and dying in a new way that we don't even have the capability or the the mental space to understand yet. Mm. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're tr- so true and so right. And, and maybe I'm asking this question prematurely in a way because none of us can see into the future. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, and know what's going to happen in the future. But it occurs to me that w- we really could use some rituals for grief in our society right now as we're going through this together. I've felt it myself in wondering like how to hold all the sadness that's out there in the world and then how to process that for myself. And I remember one day online, I saw a video of in Detroit, apparently they posted the photographs of all the people who had died of COVID and someone drove along and showed how to video of all those photos and I sat and watched it and I just started crying and it actually felt like, oh, this is the first time I've been able to literally cry or actually express grief about the deaths of people I don't know um, that, you know, I've never met them. So I don't have sorrow of that sort of loss, but it's more the community collective loss of of, of our fellow humans. And so I was just thinking that video itself provided me just a little moment of being able to finally express my grief. And, um, and I wanted to talk about the importance of that, how much we really need to have some sort of rituals and we need to have the modalities of grieving together. I think you're absolutely right. Um, ritual a lot of people are afraid of the word ritual, um, but we do rituals every day, whether we're aware of them or not. Brushing your teeth is a ritual. It's something, hopefully, that we all do at least once a day, um, and it's incorporated into our lifestyle because it has a benefit. It keeps our oral health you know, up to par. It keeps our breath from smelling, and it has other health benefits that you know help us. And what you're describing with those photos is it was a ritual. It was someone's expression of what they were witnessing. And instead of just sitting with it, which is, it could be a ritual as well, just sitting with yourself. Um, But instead of just sitting and holding that emotion in, they decided to express it, which in turn generated an emotional expression of grief from you. So it was a combination of art and ritual. And you viewing that, you were a participant in that ritual, which is why you responded the way that you did. Um, Ritual, as it pertains to death and grief, is important because it not only acknowledges that a loss has occurred, but it creates space, again, for expression of what we experience when we have a loss. One of the rituals that I perform regularly, um, at least once or twice a week is, and it, 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 it doesn't have to be emotional and you don't have to cry every time you do it, but I enjoy burning sage and incense. Um, and it may seem extremely simple and, you know, whatever, but they're, they're elements. You have the fire and you have the air. And when you're burning sage, um, depending on what you believe um, in the type of sage that you're burning, you're releasing 
negative energy from your environment and from your space and from your body and from your mind. And with the incense, what it represents to me is my prayers and thoughts and emotions leaving my, me. I'll hold an incense stick or a candle and it's escaping into the air. And when burning the sage, it's being released. So, so it's almost like a purification ritual. So I would suggest if someone's feeling heaviness or a lot of grief, I'm not saying that this is going to take it away or make it better. But what it is doing is it's a physical representation of what you may be feeling internally. And when you watch that smoke dissipate psychologically, it's almost like that emotion is leaving with it, whatever that emotion is. Mm, that's beautiful. I love the symbolism of that. And uh, I, I can see how powerful it might be and just soothing in the moment to be, to be yes. able to do something like that. And then the aromatherapy effects as well. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. And from your knowledge, the, the ancient wisdom that you share, are there any other, um, any other rituals or anything else that you use when you're helping people with grief to acknowledge the sacredness of grief? I always lean back towards a word that you used just a moment ago, which was so powerful, which is community. Um, community is so important when we're grieving, whether it's your family, which is your immediate community for many of us, or individuals who are sharing in your loss, whether they be coworkers, friends, colleagues, you know, somebody that the person who passed away, you know, we've had a special relationship um, via friendship or romantically or whatever, but when possible, if at all possible, connect with individuals who are experiencing your loss as well, because not only do they understand what you're going through and they have a common ground with you, but they knew that person and they can share stories and you guys can laugh or cry together um, and if you don't have a, that community and if you don't know those people and they're not easily accessible or open, that's where the community of like grief support comes in. Um, and I know a lot of people hear the term grief support group and they think of a bunch of people in a dark basement crying. But there's something to be said about hearing someone else say, I'm doing this, 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 or I'm feeling this, this, this and that. And being able to nod your head and say oh, my, say, oh my gosh, I know what that feels like. I'm experiencing that too. Or on the other end, hearing someone said, I went through this, but it gets better. Um, my culture is strongly founded upon this, this sense of community. And we dig very deep into that when someone passes away and makes space through communal exchange so community would be the number one thing that I would say and it seems to me that the funeral or memorial service is so important as part of that aspect of bringing community together and bringing people into a space where they can share their grief together and even share their stories and um, and, and feel their connection for sure. And the interesting thing is that because of COVID, we've been very limited in what we've been able to accomplish with that. And um, one way that we found at the funeral home where I work from time to time is that um, even if the family decides they only want to have 10 people there or when we were only allowed to have 10 people, what we would do would be to, you know, open the telephones at the funeral home. I mean, they're always open, but um, we would write down notes from people that called in asking about the service and, you know, sharing their condolences. And we attached them to balloons and tied them or sat them, you know, with weights on the chairs in the chapel or wherever the family was having the service. And when they walked in and they saw all of those balloons and we told them, these are from people who called to check on you or called to express their condolences. It was utterly moving and shocking to people because they had something to see that said, we're, we're here for you, even though we physically can't be here for you. Oh, wow. Oh, that's beautiful. I can just picture it. And uh, yes. I got I got goosebumps to imagine that <laughs> because of just 
it's like, yes, the feeling of support doesn't have to come just from other people being physically present, but knowing, having this symbolism that they reached out, they're caring about you, their, their words are here. And um, I, I, I can see how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I, was, I wanted to mention, well, you talked about this idea of people calling in, and I feel like for all the rest of us who wish to reach out to someone who's grieving, it seems like it's so important that we be courageous and empowered and recognize how much the words we speak and the messages we send make a difference. Like you were just describing at the funeral. And it made me remember after my father's death, the psychiatrist that took care of my father actually called me and uh, wanted to tell me, first of all, you know, about his own, his own sorrow and, and grief, but to tell me a few stories about my dad and some things my dad had said when he was in treatment. And that meant so much to me. It was amazing. And I, now I look at how much courage it took for him to make that phone call because he might've been afraid of my anger or whatever I was thinking or what I might say. And that reminds me that it's just so important that we remember to reach out and feel empowered and courageous and not be afraid. I agree um, with that. And you're right. I can't imagine the courage it took for him to reach out to you because he had no idea what you were feeling or what your response was going to be. And I've even been in the situation, especially um, without giving away too much information to protect this family. But there was a situation where a father killed the wife and I think two of their three children And the child that was left was a minor. So the grandparents ended up making the funeral arrangements. And I remember being in the arrangement room with them and being so uncomfortable because I just didn't know what to say. Like, what do you say? And I acknowledged that I didn't know what to say. And the grandmother thanked me because she said, you know, people have been trying to say the right thing all, all night and for the past few days. And the fact that you're acknowledging that you don't know what to say makes me feel better because I don't know how to feel right now. So we're on the same boat. And that broke the ice between us. I was able to confidently move forward performing my job because that barrier wasn't there where I felt like I had to be the person that could fix it or that could say the right thing or do the right thing. So I encourage everyone, um, if you're thinking about someone who's experienced the loss, pick up the phone and just say, I'm thinking about you. I don't know what to say, but I just want to say hi and I love you or I'm thinking about you or see if there's anything that you need. Ask, what do you need? What can I say? Is there something that I can do? I think part of our society makeup is that we have to have all the answers. We have to do it the right way or the wrong way. Um, But when it comes to death, dying, and grief, and how we experience that, it doesn't come with a playbook for the griever or the person being of support. But what will be remembered is that you didn't call or you didn't reach out and that could be in some cases more detrimental and hurtful than possibly saying the wrong thing. Another um, thing that comes to mind is that um, a friend, a a story a friend told me where a woman had lost her young child and she didn't reach out to the friend because she just didn't know what to say. She had just had a baby and it was just so uncomfortable for her to think about. And a couple years later, they had a conversation and the friend expressed that, you know, you didn't reach out to me when I lost my son and that really hurt me. And my friend then explained to her, I just didn't know what to say. And she then expressed, well, it was like he didn't exist to you. Mm. And I, I can see the power of those words of being able to say, I don't know what to say. It kind of levels the playing field and normalizes the fact that 
nobody knows. Nobody knows why these things happen. Nobody knows how we're going to get through it. But the very fact that we can acknowledge that sometimes is, is helpful to us. Yeah. Um, are there anything else when when you work with people and they're grieving as a funeral director do you offer um, like any bereavement courses for people or um, or or groups through the funeral home Um, well the funeral home offers several resources um, grief support and even professional um, resources personally I don't offer courses on grieving because I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist or mental health professional. Um, I do offer what's called a grief kit and it's actually a kit designed to help channel grief and work through the different stages of grief as they correlate with our chakra system. Um, and I also have an ebook entitled The Grief Kit Guide, which works with or without the grief kit itself. Um, and each of the items in the kit is based on a based on one of the seven chakras. Um, and in the booklet, we walk through the chakra system and the stages of grief and go over how they correlate in the items in the kit. But um, no, I don't offer any courses on grieving because I just, I just don't feel like I'm qualified to do that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Could you, would you tell us what's in the grief kit? Because I'm really curious <laughs> about it. Or, oh, sure. Or, or some of it. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you some of it. I'm not going to tell you all of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, of course, I'll refer back to the sage and the incense, which I talked about before. Um, and they're pu- the sage for purification purposes, you know, just clearing the space, clearing your environment, clearing, you know, just your mind and making room to sit with grief. Um, I don't see grief as being either negative or positive, but I think sometimes, especially in our homes and in our environments, we speak words and we speak you know, we might speak out of anger, we might be speaking out of pain, and just clearing that space allows us to neutralize and just come into a more settled environment to deal with our grief. The incense, again, when I think of incense, I think of, you know, you're using fire to light it, which is an energy, and then the smoke is being released and then dissipating into the environment and the air. And to me, that represents prayers and thoughts and well wishes and even messages to the other side. Um, I also include a crystal in the grief kit and I include this, these crystals because I believe in the healing and transformative power of crystals. Um, And I believe that there are certain crystals that, individuals can work with that I don't want to say alleviate but help through the navigation of the grieving process depending on which stage you're in and what stage you're focused on at any given time. Um, There's also um, what I call spirit candy. It's a bath and body product that I make. Um, There's a sample of the miracle soak, uh, the sugar scrub, and uh, scented shea butter. And I include those because I want to, I want us to always remember to incorporate self-care in our grieving processes, whether we're medical professionals, funeral directors, first responders, or are experiencing a personal loss of a family member or friend, just remembering to take that time to take care of yourself. And one of the most ancient ways of practicing self-care is through taking a bath. Um, And even if you can't get in the bathtub, taking a shower. Um, And that, again, represents a cleansing and a release. And the ingredients of each of those things is made with the intent of clarity and release. Oh, wow. That sounds like it would be a wonderful gift if you if you really wanted to send someone who was grieving yes. um, the, to send them the grief kit. And then it has your guide with it to, for people to read so that they know how to use each one of the items in the kit? Well, the guide is purchased separately. Um, 
but it, you can use the guide with or without the kit itself. But yeah. And so these are available on your website, thegravewoman.com? Yes. Um, you just click on the grave woman and there's a, a little tab to the left in the corner and click on that tab and then click on the grief kit and you'll be, you'll take, you'll be taken to the page for the kit and you'll have three options buy the kit, read the book or book a consultation. I also do consultations to work with you through the kit and we spend about four to five weeks together going over the kit and I walk you through the process and work, you know, help you work through some of your chakra systems or introduce you to what each chakra is and how it correlates with the grieving process. And, you know, we get to do it together or do it with your family. Um, or you can work through the kit with the book yourself. Mm. This sounds really amazing as a way to truly use the grieving process as a transformative experience to truly yes. help us at all levels to grow and actually um, maybe open ourselves to new spiritual wisdom. Yes. And that that's the intent. Um, the grief kit is for everyone. It's not a denominational kit. Um, it's not, it's not Christian. It's not Catholic. It's not, it's not anything. I selected the chakras because it's something that's very personal to me. Um, however, you can apply it to anything. We don't have to talk about the chakras. There is reading material included in each kit. Um, the reading material changes based on what's available, but I try to keep it consistent with something to do with the chakra system because I believe so much in it. But if you order a kit and you don't want that particular information, just leave it in the notes when you order. And I'll try to order a book that more aligns with what your beliefs are. It may adjust the price just a little bit depending on the cost of the book. But I try to you know, keep everything very consistent. Mm. Well, I love this idea. And I, I do think sometimes when we want to reach out to someone we care about who's grieving, we... We struggle to figure out what would be appropriate, what could we send, but this sounds beautiful and like a, a gift that would be really well received by by most people at least. I really appreciate that. And that actually that's my intention for it to be a gift. And I tried to price it in a way that was comparable to a flower, a floral arrangement, because that's normally what we give people when someone passes away is, you know, flowers. So yeah, and, and you're so right. And this is something lasting that people can yes. use and work on for weeks and months rather than flowers yes. that will be gone within one week. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's that's lovely. Now I'm excited to order one of those. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and then I know that you're offering some online courses. So I want to get into those because I really want to spread the word to people. Uh, the first one I thought to talk about is that you're doing... Um, with some others, shifting death care tools for a new paradigm. And would, would you t tell us about that course? Oh, sure. So um, back in June, I was invited to participate with five other Black leaders in the death and dying community for a live webinar called Saying It Louder, a conversation about good death in a racist society. And it was uh, Alicia Fournette, uh, Lashana Williams, a Lua author. Um, I'm going to say Naomi. I don't know Naomi's last name. And Oceana Sawyer. And it was very popular and well received. And afterwards, there was such a demand for more information about what we just discussed in our open conversation on the webinar that we decided to respond by creating this course, Shifting Death Care. Um, tools for a new paradigm so that we can help others gain a better understanding of some of the challenges facing BIPOC individuals at the end of life. Um, and it's a self-study course with four teaching modules that covers topics such as defining a good death for people on the margins, the impact of the language that we use when talking about death and dying and when someone passes away, approaching BIPOC death and grief as a guest, which is my module, 
or my contribution and exploring the complexities of grief. And that course is available online at goingwithgrace.com. And as you mentioned, it's a self-study course. You'll have six months to complete the entire course, which is plenty of time. It's full of firsthand experience, professional experience and wisdom from Black women who are in this industry working and on the front lines in various capacities, not just from the funeral director capacity. Um, And it's the biggest and most challenging project I've worked on in my entire professional career, but I'm extremely not only proud of myself, but each of the other four ladies who contributed to this project. And it's been getting um, an astounding response and I'm just really excited about it and I hope that everyone will check it out. I also have eight courses available currently on my website um, ranging from cultural competency to breaking into the funeral industry to racism and death care to funeral director or death care professional self-care which I think after this conversation I'm going to begin marketing to medical professionals and first responders because I I feel like there's a need in your arena as well for this. Yes, definitely. And I, I wanted to say I'm so um, pleased that that you women have stepped up and that you're offering us these courses and this education because coming from the hospice world, I can tell you that BIPOC individuals are so underrepresented as patients in hospice, but also as workers in hospice. And it's one of those health disparities that we really have to work on. We really need to make improvements. We have to educate ourselves. We have to look at all of the systemic bias and, and not be afraid to bring that to light and work through that so that we can we can make sure that that the best end of life care is available to everyone in our society. I agree. Um, and it's so funny because prior to the George Floyd murder, I had no idea what BIPOC meant. I had never heard this word before. And then all of a sudden it was everywhere. So for those that don't know, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, and if you're not a white person, you fall into this category. And if you are a white person, you're not a part of this community. And I think that, um, it's just as sad and as tragic as that situation was and is, it's just opened the door for so much conversation. And I'm just so grateful that individuals and people like yourself are just so open and so hungry for this information because it's only making us more competent and inclusive in the work that we do. Um, And like you said, addressing biases, a lot of times we aren't even aware of our own biases because they're just so integrated into who we are and the way that we grew up. Um, And white people aren't the only ones that can have biases. They're biases that I didn't realize I had as a black woman. Yeah, and it's so it's so important that simple things like you were mentioning from your course, just the language that we use, the words that we choose. And looking back now, when I look at how we how we educated people around hospice and end of life care, we were not careful at all or sensitive at all to the feelings of of the people who would receive that material. We weren't even aware that some people have some fears about the about the healthcare profession and how how they might be treated by people and we so we we didn't really address any of those crucial issues and we weren't careful at all and i'm so happy that we're all waking up right now and paying more attention and because that's obviously the first step in order to make things better it is it is and and you mentioned even simple things like cultural competency competency for funeral professionals, even something like um, knowing how to how to deal with hair and, and skin issues yes. you know, as, as they're caring for a body. It's just so important that we all have diverse tools in our, in our toolkits here when we're offering services. Yes, and um, 
I didn't realize, you know, when you know how to do something and it's just a part of your everyday life, you forget that other people don't have that same skill set or knowledge. And that was one of the things that shocked me the most coming into the funeral industry was that even in school, we're not taught how to work with anyone but white people's hair and skin. And I don't know about everybody else, but the last time I checked, white people weren't the only people that died and required our services. Um, And there have been situations, I always tell the story about walking into the funeral home as an apprentice and a middle-aged white man was working with the body of a, a young black woman who had passed away. And she had what was called what's called black, uh, not black box braids in her hair. And the family had said that they wanted the braids taken out the, so that her natural hair could be, you know, viewed for her services. And he was cutting the braids from the scalp out of her hair oh. because he thought that that's how you took the braids out. And I, I I stopped him and he wasn't doing it maliciously. He just honestly didn't know any better. And I asked him, well, if you cut all, if you cut this from her scalp, where's her hair? You know, and he, he felt horribly, but the fact that he didn't know, yeah. and you were, you know, you work with, we work with black clientele regularly. This is something that should be a basic. So That, along with many, many other things, inspired me to create the course Cultural Competency, Black Hair, Skin and Cosmetic Care for non-ethnic funeral professionals because people just don't know. Matching makeup is completely different on lighter, fairer white skin than it is for deeper, richer, darker skin, Mm -hmm. you know? And a part of the entire purpose of a funeral and of viewing a body is to have a final memory picture and to bring some type of reality to the loss. And if you're looking at an individual in the casket who does not resemble your loved one or doesn't look like your loved one in any way because their hair isn't done properly, their makeup is off, the color is wrong, it's even more traumatizing. It creates a negative memory picture for the family. And I know that you know, white funeral professionals aren't co- sitting in a basement conspiring to make black bodies look, you know, horribly at the time of viewing. But by not taking the responsibility of learning how to care for our hair and our skin and our cosmetic needs correctly, that's essentially what you're doing. So mm-hmm. that course is available online at the time. Um, in, in-person trainings will be available once all of this COVID and everything blows over and it's safe for me to travel and do, you know, hands-on training because we have to get a little close. (laughs) Um, But yeah. Um, And then another course that is near and dear to my heart that's available on the website again is the self-care. We give so much of ourselves, whether as professionals or, you know, people that are of support in the death and dying community. And now I'm realizing in your community as well, the medical community, It's important to remember that we have to take care of ourselves in order to give from, I don't even want to say a full cup, but a cup that has something in it. (laughs) Yes, so true. And probably particularly in 2020, when when everyone's under added stress dealing with COVID, self-care becomes even more important. Yes, and it's, it's actually the shortest course that I teach. It's about 45 minutes long. But I can say that it's received, at least on my end, some of the most impactful and tear-jerking reviews because people are realizing I haven't been taking care of myself. So how am I even trying to take care of others? And then hearing how they incorporate some of the things that we talk about in the course um, into their daily lives and how much better not they're not only feeling mentally and spiritually, but how much more they feel as if they're able to give. I just love reading the reviews from my students because it just reminds me like, okay, take care of yourself so that you can help take care of everyone else. And everything's done online at the time. We're we're teaching the courses on a schedule, but we're working very hard to get it to where you can do a self-study 
like with the shifting the paradigm course, but that's going to take a little bit of time. So please just be patient with us. But if you can't attend a class on the day it's scheduled, just shoot me an email and let me know. And I'm pretty flexible. I'll try to work with you on your schedule. And then, Joel, do you have an email list or a, a newsletter that goes out that people could sign up for so then they could get notices from you when you offer new things? Oh, for sure. Just visit my website and the first pop up that's going to come up is going to ask for your email address. And that's going to sign you up for any notifications that I send out. I don't send out a newsletter on a consistent basis. I'm kind of horrible at that. But I do. I try to send out at least one or two emails a month. Um, More recently, I've been sending out more because I've been a lot more busy and participating in much more, you know, activity. So, I'd say I send out an email about once every week now, but just sign up in the pop-up and you'll receive just about everything that, you know, we have going on over at The Grave Woman. Yeah, I'd encourage everyone to go to thegravewoman.com and check it out because you're just, Joelle, you're just offering such a wealth of information, the grief kit, um, self-care for death professionals, cultural competency, like everything that you're putting out there, I think is is exactly what we need right now. So this this is all uh, so important and so helpful to all of us as we're trying to learn and trying to grow together to to do a better job at taking care of everyone at the end of life. I appreciate that. That that really means a lot. Um, I put my heart and my soul into everything that I put out. And I hope that's felt by everyone who, you know, comes across my page. Definitely. Definitely. Your heart and your, and your spirit. And so I, um, I just, I love, I love what you're creating and I'm so, I'm grateful that you came to talk to me about it and that we can share it with other people too, because I know it's going to be helpful. Thank you. Well, um, take care and um, good luck. And hopefully I I wanted to say, I saw you, uh, you and the other, the other ladies on say it louder in June. So that's where I first got it. Oh, yay. That's that was you one of me. the thousands of people <laughs> that was listening in that day. And it was amazing. Actually, I wanted to ask, is that still, is there a recording of that available anywhere? I'm pretty sure that it is. If you go to um, Alua's website, which is goingwithgrace.com, you should be able to find it there. Um, I will try to find it and send you the link. Okay, because maybe I could link to that for listeners who wanted to. Oh, yeah. It it was amazing. It was really wonderful. I really don't. I try not, like, I'm not a big promoter, but I think everybody needs to hear that. Everybody needs to hear that conversation. We didn't have an agenda. We didn't have speaking points. It was just an honest and raw conversation. And the information that came out during that webinar, I mean, if you work in an environment where you you are not a person of color, but you engage with people of color and BIPOC individuals regularly, you need to hear what was said in that in that, that webinar. It was profound. It was definitely profound. It opened my eyes. It got me excited. And that's why we're having this conversation today, because it introduced me to you and, um, and so many other powerful leaders in this community. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. And hopefully we'll get to speak again soon and maybe do this again. Yes. Oh, I'd love to. I love to. And I hope some, I hope there'll be a day someday when we get to meet face to face somewhere too. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I would love that. Especially if it's in Colorado. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. That, That would be wonderful. Well, thanks again, Joelle. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed my interview with Joelle Anthony. And I'm very excited about this interview, particularly because of her rich awareness of the spirituality around death and dying and grief and the fact that she grew up with it culturally and I'm just so in awe of that and how she applies it to the work she's doing today. I'm excited about her grief kit and I plan to order it particularly because I would love to learn more about grief and the chakras 
And I think that's a really powerful way to view grief and how we carry it within our physical and energetic body. And also how we might be able to help shift it if it's stuck in one particular area or not. And then how to really embody a practice for grief and embody our mourning, I guess, so that we're not just grieving in our heads or in our hearts, but grieving with our entire body. And I feel like that has a lot of power for us as, as we're dealing with grief and also as we're creating rituals around grief to help people move through their grief and really experience it and feel the grief and go into it fully, body, mind, and spirit. So that grief kit is very intriguing to me excited to order that and then also the online course that Joelle is teaching with Elua Arthur and I believe three other death care practitioners on shifting death care tools for a new paradigm it's a self-study course so that should make it practical for any of us because we can do it on our own time uh, anytime within the next six months. And that is going to be really powerful as we look at how do we recognize and deal with racism within the death care industry and how do we make our death care and end of life care more equitable and just and fair for everyone and to make sure that we're meeting the needs of everyone in our vast and diverse communities. And I know that all of us who care about providing end-of-life services do care that we offer just and equitable care to everyone and that we eliminate the disparities that currently exist in our system. So check out Shifting Death Care and then also join me. Check out that grief kit uh, from Joelle. I think that's amazing. So thanks again for joining me here today. And stay tuned every single Monday for a brand new episode. I'll be back again next week. If you like this content, remember to share it with other people who might be able to benefit from it. Also, you can leave a review on iTunes or wherever else you happen to be listening. And if you're not a subscriber, be sure and subscribe there as well. The more subscribers I have and the more reviews the podcast has, the more it will be shown to people who are searching for this kind of content. And finally, you can also support the podcast by making a small monthly donation on my page at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash E-O-L-U, and you'll get a monthly end-of-life news update. And also from time to time, some other bonuses, like some movie reviews that my husband and I started doing, but then kind of fell apart during the pandemic. But hopefully we'll be getting back to that. So until next week, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever comes next, and love each and every moment of your beautiful life. Bye-bye.